So he set out in 1921 to, um, to, to make himself a, a, a writer. Uh, he was conscious of wanting to link his identity as an African-American um, to world culture because he saw peoples of the world, the peoples of the world as essentially united. He saw the ideal of social justice as something that was worth fighting for, fighting with, uh, with words, with poems, and so on, in particular, as far as he was concerned. And so he dedicated himself um, to that task. And uh, somebody asked me earlier today, is, they said, well, you, you know, you claim somewhere that, um, that Langston Hughes fought a, fi fought a long fight all his life, uh, and that he emerged victorious. That he, but I, I do think he, he, I mean, you are here today as testimony to the fact that he, um, you know, that, that, that his words continue to matter. His words are something that people build on, that words people draw on, and um, in, in their daily lives, uh, some sort of, you know, less, um, uh, frequently or less devotedly than others, but that's the way of the world with artists, with poets, and, and so on. But by and large, if you look at all the difficulties he faced in, in, uh, in life, um, the poverty, the humiliation of appearing before this committee or that committee, the accusations of being a communist, uh, the accusations of being too radical as a, an African-American, uh, then accusations of not being radical enough uh, at a certain point in our, in our evolving history. Uh, when you look at all that, that, that he went through uh, and then consider how he persevered and how he continued to publish, um, I would have to say that in, in, in the end, and especially when you think of how wonderfully young people, children, uh, older young people, how they respond to his work, how for so many of them, you know, their introduction to poetry, their, the foundation of their love for poetry uh, is often rooted in uh, being introduced to that world through the works of Langston Hughes. So I think if you can say that you have succeeded in that way, um, you know, after your, or if it can be said of you that you succeeded in that way, then you achieve something. And I think he did achieve something. Um, uh, with, with, with his life, his career. Uh, the dream was deferred. He, you know, he talks about that uh, in poems that we know so very well. Um, and um, I'm sure that, that uh, there must have been moments in his life, particularly towards the end when he wondered whether he had, um, had, uh, had made his mark, uh, that he would wondered whether he would be remembered. But the fact is that he is remembered. Um, and Moments such as this one, celebrations such as this one, publications such as the two that we have up there, I think on the screen behind, behind me, um, indicate uh, the, in, the, the continuing vitality of what he brought uh, to America, to black America, to America, to, to, to the world um, as, a, as an artist, as a, as a, as a poet. Uh, I thought that I would begin um, my little part of, the, um, of this, of this uh, poem by reading one of his poems. Um, and maybe, maybe, which one should I read? The Negro Speaks of Rivers, which everyone knows, or The Weary Blues, which everyone knows? <laughs> what do you say, David? Um, We're waiting. <laughs> yeah, now uh, let's do The Weary Blues. The Weary Blues, that's, that's good because, after all, this was a poem that, uh, that, that changed his life. I mean, he'd been writing poetry from high school days in Cleveland. Um, then he finds his voice in, at the age of 19 and sends um, The Negro Speaks of Rivers to the Crisis, where Jesse Fawcett, the literary executor, um, takes it and publishes it, and it's the first time Hughes has published um, a, a poem, or any work, in a national journal, the NAACP's uh, The Crisis. Um, and from that period, around 19, uh, well, not around, in 1921, until 
1926. Uh, he is doing all sorts of extraordinary things, living in Europe, going down the coast of Africa, living in Mexico, um, and um, drawing into his poetry uh, as he was composing it, as he was putting together a body of work, the jazz, jazz and the blues above all. And these were taboo for most African-American poets. His great rival, uh, a very worthy poet, County Cullen, said, you cannot write poetry about blues and jazz. That's the opposite of poetry. Uh, so stop it, Langston. Uh, <laughs> all right. um, Langston persevered. And of course, in 1926, the same year that uh, The Very Blues was published, he published in The Nation magazine his great manifesto, The Negro Artist and the Racial Mountain, which ends with him saying, you know, the, we younger Negro artists intend to, to, to explore our individual dark-skinned selves uh, and draw on blues and draw on jazz. And he says, if white people are, uh, are happy with what we do, great. If they're not happy, it doesn't matter. If black people are happy with what we do, great. If they're not, that we stand on the mountaintop, uh, confident within ourselves, and uh, we march in, in, into the future. 